My name is Susan Fisk. I'm a professor at Princeton University, and I come from a long line of inspiring women. Uh, for example, my great-great-grandmother um, was uh, a leader in women's suffrage, and my grandmother was also. And my great-great-aunt was uh, an artist, an artist model uh, for St. Gaudens. So I come from a long line of inspiring women. Also, my mother worked with community groups in Chicago for many years. So the other big influence on my um, professional interests uh, was my father, who was a, a psychometrician and a professor uh, who taught me that you have to measure things carefully. So there was a combination of an interest in making the world a better place and social activism and having the science so that you would have some credibility. So uh, when I was in graduate school, I got very interested in intergroup relations. It was during uh, the late 70s and we were very interested in intergroup relations and civil rights and women's rights. And so um, I decided I wanted to go into that area because um, when I was growing up, I went to a fully racially integrated school and I thought the whole world was like that. And then when I moved to Boston, my experience was that it was mostly white people I was surrounded by. And that just seemed strange to me. And I was trying to figure out why in these two different places I was growing up, things were so radically different. So in the course of my work on stereotyping and prejudice, um, and because I study this, I'll never be out of work. Um, you know, it's kind of human nature to be a little nervous about people who are different from you. And, um, but with globalization and immigration, there's a lot of diversity coming into people's lives in ways that was not true before. And so what I've set as my task is to understand how people make sense of diversity and how people think about other people. In particular, um, it's very easy to illustrate how, it, how this works. Um, our stereotype content model says, what do you want to know about another person who's moving into your neighborhood or coming to work at the desk next to you at work? You want to know two things about them. One is you want to know, do they have good intentions? Are they going to cooperate? Are they going to get with the program? Or are they there to compete and have um, destructive intentions? So we call that warmth. And the other dimension is whether they can act on those intentions. And we call that um, competence. So this warmth by competence space, it turns out to explain all kinds of things. So people like us, that is, for example, in the US, the middle class, um, are both warm and competent in our stereotypes of us. Uh, the people who are low on both in the, include homeless people, drug addicts, um, people who don't have an address all over the world, it turns out, are seen as neither competent nor trustworthy. So that much you can get out of regular sort of people's ideas about prejudice, but uh, what we contribute are the mixed combinations. So there are some groups that are seen as well-intentioned, but uh, incompetent. And old people are stereotyped that way. So they're seen as, um, you know, nice, but useless all over the world. And uh, then the other mixed combination is people who are seen as highly competent, but not very nice. So rich people all over the world are seen that way. So you have this mixed impression of older people and of rich people on the one hand, and then you have these all good, all bad combinations uh, for middle class people and uh, homeless people. So it turns out that you can apply this to different kinds of ethnic groups. So in the US, because of accidents of immigration and our history, um, Asians are seen as highly competent but not very social. Jewish people have often been seen that way. Uh, for us, Immigrants, particularly Latino immigrants, are seen as neither competent nor trustworthy. Uh, in the past, the Irish were there, but now the Irish are seen as regular Americans. So what, the point I'm trying to make is that stereotypes are accidents of history. Who happens to immigrate under what circumstances? But there's a system to it. This warmth by competent space helps you to understand where the groups fit into society. 
And we've seen all over the world, we've now got data from 50 countries over the last couple of decades, and you can make a map of how all these groups relate to each other. And it makes sense. When you look at the map, you feel like you have a cultural map of the country. And it helps us to understand this. So you might want to th wonder whether there's anything to do about it. Are we just stuck with these stereotypes? And there's two things I'd like to say about that. One is that um, over time, people get used to diversity. So over a 10 or 12 year time, if you're just on the subways in New York and you're opposite people of all different ethnicities, you get used to them. And at some point, it's just, we're all New Yorkers. Hawaii is the same way. It's very multicultural. People are used to each other. We're all Hawaiians. But in places where people don't actually meet every day, people who are different from them, then people have these elaborate stereotype maps, mental maps. Um, the other thing I would say is, especially for people who are in teaching, the best way to get kids, or, or adults for that matter, to get along with each other is to get, put them on a team together. So if people are working together for something they care about, a sports team, building a playground for children, um, some kind of community thing, if they need each other to accomplish what they want to accomplish, they get over their stereotypes. It's like if the boss says to you, you and you, you're on a team together and your bonus depends on your finishing this project together. People are very good at individuating other people. So I have some hope for the future that people will get past their initial stereotypes.